Okay, so uh, last lecture we talked about uh, uh, linear stability of uh, finite difference schemes and we used one Newman method to show uh, stability of several uh, common schemes for advection and for diffusion. Uh, based on that we established that many of those schemes uh, have stability criterion like for example for advection based on uh, uh, velocity uh, like uh, if you have velocity uh, u or c times uh, delta t divided by delta x so this is called current number uh, and usually this current number absolute value because c can be positive or negative should be smaller or equal certain criteria, some mu critical. And uh, in some cases, uh, well, for the schemes that we considered, usually mu was like one, but for other schemes that we didn't consider, it could be as uh, different criteria, but usually they, they uh, smaller than one, um, can be like 0 0.5, 0 0.37, 0 0.65, depending on a, a mostly on the time scheme that you use. So far we considered Euler scheme and Leapfrog scheme for time derivative, but could be other schemes. Uh, so, and from that, um, and also for diffusion, we derived uh, similar criteria that uh, diffusion coefficient times delta t divided by delta x squared, this dimensionless uh, diffusion current number should be also smaller than some criteria, like in our case it was one half, but it could be something else, uh, some other limits as well, depending on the time scheme, for example, for Adams batch four schemes that we're going to talk about uh, later, third order, it can be like 0 0.1 instead of uh, 0 0.5. Uh, so it's a uh, Depends. So from that, I don't want to. You you may um, you may have this conclusion that the stability, say, of advection or stability of equation when you have advection and diffusion uh, is only limited by um, by uh, magnitudes of velocity uh, and diffusion coefficient. But actually, uh, that's not true. Uh, there, there should be some other consideration in certain situations. For example, when you have propagation of a signal uh, due to sound waves or due to gravity waves, you may have additional constraints that are not so apparent right away based on uh, uh, just looking at the advection portion of the, those equations or diffusion portions of those equations. And for that, let's consider an example, practical example, one-dimensional compressible uh, idea, ideal gas flow. So if we have a uh, uh, compressible gas and then it, it's moving in one direction. And then generally, if you have, uh, it's compressible. So if you heat it in one place, it may generate actually some flow uh, because of pressure wave. And then, then it actually may generate a shock wave eventually. So, uh, but in the, in our case, we're not going to consider all these nonlinear effects, but we're going to uh, like shock waves. But just uh, let's say we have one dimensional flow and let's study stability constraint if we apply, say, Leapfrog scheme to solving uh, that system of equations. So we have uh, 1D compressible, compressible ideal gas gas flow. <coughs> you can easily generalize it on uh, two, uh, two or three dimensions. So uh, we have equations, of course, first one is a uh, momentum equation. So we have du dt equals to minus one over rho dp dx. This is pressure gradient force. This is total uh, derivative, our material derivative. Then we have a continuity equation which says that uh, d rho dt, and I assume that you know those equations 
from your fluid dynamics class. Uh, the rho dt plus divergence of mass flux, which is d dx uh, rho u equals to zero. So this is a uh, momentum equation. This is a uh, continuity equation. And then we have we need to have uh, we have uh, you need to have one more equation. Uh, so uh, that connects, uh, and for that we will use uh, energy equation. Or in this case, we assume that it's an adiabatic process. So for adiabatic process, we have uh, pressure divided by rho in power of kappa equals to constant. The kappa is just Cp over Cv. Uh, adiabatic constant. We don't use uh, here uh, um, ideal gas law because in that case we would introduce a new variable which is temperature and uh, so it's enough then uh, uh, we would just it, it, it doesn't it doesn't show up directly in these two equations so this one equation uh, adiabatic uh, relation it's actually uh, sufficient so introducing temperature don't really add anything new here. So we have three equations, three unknowns, and we want to solve that. So let's uh, first uh, write it in a slightly different form. First of all, we need some... Oh, first of all, let's look at the continuity equation. We can rewrite it as by differentiating this using chain full rule and making full derivative. So this continuity equation becomes um, D, sorry, run out of good, D rho D dt um, equals to minus, minus rho uh, D u dx, sorry. Okay, so, uh, and, and now looking at this equation, we actually uh, want some prognostic equation, say, for pressure. Uh, because, uh, so let's, uh, let's write it as the following. Oh, I really need one, I wonder. Yes, actually we do. So we're trying to get rid of uh, uh, derivative of density using derivative of pressure. So let's look at this equation, just differentiate it with respect to time, full derivative, and using log uh, differentiation by logarithms. In that case, we have one over P, dP dt, minus kappa, one over rho, d rho dt, Hope one you understand how I, have, I did that equals to zero. So now uh, we have uh, let's multiply both sides by p. We have d p d t uh, minus uh, kappa, and then uh, p divided by rho. It's going to be r t kappa r t d rho dt equals to zero or uh, now kappa rt is the speed of sound squared so we have dp dt equals to uh, c s squared d rho dt so this is nice relationship so we can actually replace this equation with this equation 
So if we substitute this guy, we have minus rho C S square D U D X. So now we have some pretty uh, like some symmetry here. Uh, like with this, this with this equation. So we have uh, um, so now we can uh, let's now linearize uh, because we uh, we want to look at stability analysis of linear equation. We cannot look at stability analysis of nonlinear equation in this case so easily. So let's look at stability. For that we need to linearize uh, around some basic state, and uh, so we assume that our u equals to some u naught plus u prime. And um, P equals some P naught plus some perturbation and density approximately equal to, uh, well, rho naught plus rho prime. So now these full derivatives, uh, they look like d dt equals to d dt plus u, say, um, any variable phi, d phi dx plus v d phi dy. So um, we basically let's uh, assume that our basic state we can just because it's one dimensional problem you you can make it zero just arbitrary. If it's not zero, you, uh, as if you trans you tr you've been translated maybe with that velocity, but uh, just uh, uh, we don't need this u. And besides, if you well, in this case it is no, of course. Why? If u is constant, u naught is constant because this is linear solution. You have that this uh, uh, d u d t And uh, u naught will disappear here because it's constant. So only the perturbation uh, remains. So if we do that, um, we'll uh, and then we ignore uh, second order terms like perturbation times perturbation and and, and so on. We uh, cross those out. And so if you do that, you will arrive to the following system of equations that. Gonna, we're going to study for stability. So linearized equation will look like the following. Uh, so d p d t uh, equals to a plus u naught d p d t, where p here is a, a perturbation. I just drop all these asterisks here dp dx equals to minus rho naught c s square uh, d u dx and d u dt plus u naught d u dx equals to minus one over, over rho naught dp dx. And true not as in this case is constant. Uh, okay, so we have now two equations, two unknowns. Uh, rho naught is kind of basic state, so it's known. So we have two equations for two unknowns, P and U. So this is the system <coughs> of equation we're going to study. Um, so let's, uh, uh, how we solve it numerically, uh, we use Let's use leapfrog scheme in this case, applied to, to this equation, and then we study stability of, uh, of the leapfrog scheme. So leapfrog scheme. That, that would make sense to use. Um, so we have... Um, So what if we divide by rho naught, we have everywhere 
because run out is a constant, does not let me see that does not depend on x. We replace pi just for simplicity with, with phi, where phi is defined as pi divided by rho naught. In this case, it's simpler. Okay, so we use the leapfrog scheme, a scheme which is phi n plus 1 minus, um, so we greet, uh, we have greet, uh, a grid, in this case let's call it uh, k in x and n in time. So leapfrog scheme k plus uh, k, uh, n plus 1, n minus 1 divided by delta t. Uh, uh, equals to minus u naught uh, and we use center differences with leapfrog scheme because for that case we establish that it's stable for a certain uh, range uh, if we use uh, uh, that's why we use leapfrog if you used uh, earl, uh, earlier scheme it wouldn't would be unstable in any case so we have k plus 1 n minus phi k minus 1 n divided by, and here 2 delta t of course, by 2 delta x minus c s square u k plus 1 n minus u k minus 1 n. So we, we use central differences. Also, similar scheme for you. I run, I'm running out of juice here. So this is what we would put in our computer and we assume periodic domain for example that means that periodic domain means that uh, if you have this grid that this is your n this is 1 2 n so n plus 1 equal to 1 so phi at n plus 1 equal to phi 1 and phi and certainly phi 1 equal to n plus 1. So it's basically signal constantly moving it's in a circle. Uh, in that case, you don't need boundary conditions. So there are no boundary conditions in, a, in X. Makes makes problem simpler. No reflections and stuff like that. So now uh, let's introduce... Uh, um, Yeah, so uh, now let's, uh, we can uh, multiply so we can multiply both equations by delta t and uh, so, uh, but now we will use solution in a, of our Fourier, uh, as a Fourier harmonics, so phi k n equals to, remember we, for stability we did this, lambda n uh, uh, e to the power i k i alpha k and u the same lambda it's uh, uh, just uh, we can always scale it so that lambda is the same and uh, because it's linear in nature, lambda, uh, the simplification factor will be the same for phi and u because of the linear uh, nature of equations. So we have um, uh, E i alpha k, and of course we need to multiply by some amplitude, which is, does not depend on space and time. So let's call them those, so they just constants. 
we need to do that otherwise um, it's going to be the same as skin of B so they different by amplitude so now we substitute those in these guys and uh, if we do that I will spare you some uh, writing here but it's basically the same uh, as we did before except that and we except that we have uh, have to use here some earlier relation remembering that it's cosine alpha plus i sine alpha it's when you subtract and if we do those things we and then uh, we have two equations and then we actually multiply uh, uh, multiply those equations we well not yet so we'll arrive to the following if we substitute that lambda square minus one plus i u naught delta t divided by delta x times two sigma lambda where sigma by definition is just sine alpha so times uh, magnitude of I mean amplitude phi equals to minus cs square uh, delta t divided by delta x lambda times i two sigma u amplitude so that's one one equation then second equation is the same this guy times amplitude u equals to delta t divided by delta x lambda i two sigma phi amplitude so there is certain symmetry here uh, so now what we do well uh, in order to get rid of uh, amplitudes uh, phi and u and get only equation for lambda we multiply a uh, left and right hand side of these two equations by each other and we'll get uh, in that case then uh, we have product of u and phi on both sides and we can cancel them and uh, so if you do that you will have equation that lambda square minus one plus i u naught delta t divided by delta x and here before that we immediately see this kind of current numbers here right so this one is our mu velocity times delta t divided by delta x and uh, and when we multiply these guys we will have another current number so we introduce another one called mu s equal spear of sound divided uh, times delta t divided by delta x so instead of uh, velocity u you have speed of sound and then if you do that you will have that lambda square minus one plus i mu times two sigma lambda squared equals uh, minus mu s squared four sigma So that's why uh, when you multiply it's positive and then you multiply two i's you get minus here. Okay, so now we have uh, this equation and now we need uh, we can take and sigma square here. We need to take square root of this guy, which means that square root of this guy is negative uh, is positive and here is negative sign, so squared equal to negative, it means the square root of that should involve some uh, imaginary number. So we have lambda square minus one plus i mu two sigma lambda 
equals to plus minus i mu s times 2 sigma. And so now we can combine with this term and we get equation like the following. Lambda squared plus i mu plus minus mu s 2 sigma lambda minus 1 equals to 0. So our problem now uh, reduced to this one equation and we need to show for which conditions lambda for stability absolute value should be smaller or equal than 1. So you see that this quadratic equation uh, with complex numbers and we already solved this equation before I just now instead of mu here we have actually combination of mu plus minus speed of sound. So we have, so principally it's the same uh, equation, I just we replace mu with this new mu and we want not going to re uh, uh, re uh, redo it again, but from our analysis of leapfrog scheme in previous lecture, we then conclude that for stability, stable if absolute va value mu plus minus or well, let's write it not in terms of mu it's uh, u naught plus minus speed of sound times delta t divided by delta x should be smaller or equal than uh, less than or equal than one so you see that <laughs> Even though there was no speed of sound as an advection of something in our equations, but it appeared in the stability criterion uh, as if it's like normal velocity. So you see, we sometimes our signal, and especially like for example, if you write it for uh, for gravity waves or something, for say shallow water equations with gravity wave speeds, it's it's totally hidden from you you may not even realize that th there is actually a different constraint than just your advection. You need to take into account speed of sound or, or, gra or in case of shallow water equations, uh, gravity wave speed in order to uh, uh, your scheme was stable. And this is uh, very uh, important to realize. Now, in meteorological, in meteorological applications, our U is uh, in the water, I don't know, uh, 10 meters per second. Well, in a jet stream, it can be 100 meters per second too, so to maybe 100 meters per second. So uh, this is our range, and CS is about 340 meters per second near the ground uh, where uh, for temperatures about 300 Kelvin. So, uh, but bottom line that CS is in most places except for this jet stream it's much greater than u naught so it's a it's a Mach number a ratio of velocity to speed of sound is a Mach number the Mach number is of course very small in atmosphere except for hurricanes and uh, uh, and tornadoes where it can be actually uh, comparable or jet streams uh, or, uh, and um, so uh, we conclude that most stability in this case is dictated not by velocity, but mostly dictated by speed of sound, stability of our equations. And, uh, and this is true for any compressible uh, set of equations or equations that contain some gravity wave in them. Gravity wave speeds are fortunately not as fast. So they're not as, as constraining, but speed of sound is definitely this kind of constraint could uh, uh, could uh, significantly reduce your time step uh, to be able to solve uh, these equations. 
So for horizontal uh, uh, grid spacing, uh, when in our models is usually like cloud resolving models, so that uh, that re uh, resolve clouds. Typical uh, grid spacing delta x uh, is one kilometer or thousand meters. So a typical time step for velocity, it would mean like if it's like say ten meters per second, velocity is a maximum velocity on your grid. Then it would mean that for delta uh, for u not equals to ten meters per second, it means that delta t would be if it was only dictated by your advection, would be smaller than a thousand meters divided by ten. It's a uh, hundred seconds, so it's very long time. It takes hundred seconds for wind to propagate from one grid point to another grid point, but speed of sound is say 330 meters per second, then delta t will be smaller than 3 seconds. And that would dictate your time step, not velocity. So if you use compressible model, regardless of your field, velocity field, your time steps would be, should be smaller than 3 seconds, regardless of uh, what you're simulating. And uh, that, of course, big deal. And how to avoid that? So imagine a large edge simulation, large edge simulation, which we're going to talk about later as a technique. But it's basically a turbulence model with resolution of about typical uh, maybe uh, 10 meters. 10 meters, and velocities are also about 10 meters per second. That's quite possible. In a boundary layer, when you have strong convection, for example, uh, convecting boundary layer heated by from by the surface, then this 10 meters divided by 10 uh, meters per second wind, you get well, something like delta t of over, uh, of about one second. And if you're simulating, say, one day evolution of boundary layer, it's uh, 86,000 seconds. So you would need uh, 86 at least close to 100,000 uh, steps, time steps with your model to simulate just one day. But if you used only, I mean, this one second, if you use uh, velocity as your constraint, but if you use for speed of sound, it would be about, uh, uh, so it's uh, 10 divided by 3, 30, so it's about 0. Point uh, 0 0.03 seconds, so 300 of a second. So, and, and this is what you, if your large edge simulation is compressible, solve compressible equations like WARF, for example, WARF model, weather forecasting, uh, uh, weather forecasting model, uh, what is weather research, uh, WARF, weather research uh, forecasting model, yeah. So uh, you will have uh, to run, uh, never use it for a large simulation model because your time step would be like so small, it would be disaster. But moreover, if you use, uh, usually, this is what I was talking about horizontal grid, it's one kilometer grid, say, for cloud resolving model for when you resolve thunderstorm, let's say. But vertical grid is much finer than that. Vertical grid, you cannot make one kilometer. Uh, you will miss the whole action in the vertical. So you need probably something like in the order of 100 meter grid spacing. In that case, all these numbers divide by 10. So in reality, in three-dimensional model, you will be constrained by vertical grid spacing because speed of sound also propagates vertically. So instead of three seconds, you would have to run with 0 0.3 seconds. Uh, and in terms of large simulation, well, in large simulation, actually vertical resolution is comparable to horizontal, so that's not a problem. But for cloud resolving model, you will be constrained severely by vertical uh, current, uh, vertical uh, grid spacing. It will be very, believe me, it's very short time step. Uh, so your forecast would be very expensive to run. Fortunately, WARF and other models that use uh, com that compressible, they actually uh, you uh, may do some trick. Uh, 
avoiding using using explicit this kind of explicit scheme when uh, your right hand side has information only on time step n but instead use so-called implicit schemes for the vertical direction uh, using so-called time splitting schemes when you uh, you use the explicit leapfrog slice scheme in the horizontal direction and implicit schemes that use information in the future and n plus one we will talk about that a little bit later in that case, you avoid this constraint in the vertical, but still horizontal constraint uh, remains. Okay, so uh, so far um, we considered schemes such that our next time uh, time level n plus one was on the left hand side, and on, so we had something like value in one point k at level n plus one uh, depending on the scheme it's some function of phi m at time seven time uh, uh, level n phi uh, m at time level minus one and so on for m equals to say k from k to some uh, n1, uh, m, k1, uh, to k plus k2, depending on our scheme, it can be minus, say, a grid points. So, so we have uh, k here and some points. We have our final difference approximation and some points in here. And we're moving, this is time level n, n plus 1. And we computed only this point here and all the information was coming from all other points to this point. So this, uh, it's very natural scheme. It's easy to use, easy to solve, easy to program. Just basically moving through case for your future time step n plus one. And for each k, you compute your right hand side, and that's very easy. So you update, update all your phi's at uh, n plus one for given for each of the k's, and you then apply your boundary conditions, and then you move to next time level n plus one. And that's that. This type of scheme is called explicit scheme. So explicit. So you explicitly, you you explicit in making uh, uh, you compute only one value in one grid point through values in uh, other grid points directly. So it's explicitly. So it's very easy to do. So these explicit schemes, unfortunately, all of them, basically all of them, uh, they have. Uh, uh, some restriction on time step and the reason is because there is this kind of cone of influence propagation of, uh, along the characteristics and those characteristics can be dictated by advection as we saw before by diffusion or by speed of sound so if you have speed of sound your cone is kind of wider uh, and uh, because your information can propagate very fast so your time step uh, becoming smaller and smaller and um, but so there is always always stability criterion stability issues so delta t always should be smaller than some delta t crit critical for the ex explicit schemes and that uh, um, that can represent some problems for especially for flaws that have speed of sound in them and this speed of sound is large uh, so we talked about speed of sound in uh, air which is 340 meters per second now imagine speed of sound in the in the ocean let's say it's along some ocean flow in water and speed of sound in the ocean can be way above 1000 meters per second and so your constraint is even uh, your time step would be even uh, smaller so that's main issue with this um, 
explicit schemes that you always constrained uh, there is some order, there is some constraint or time step. There is another type of scheme, so-called explicit schemes, or I mean implicit schemes. When uh, you're actually computing your future values in not in one grid point, but on uh, but on many of them at once. Uh, let's. Um, Let's consider an example of, of our advection equation. So uh, we have this advection equation. D phi dt plus c d phi dx equals to zero. And we, let's say we use, um, we use a uh, Euler scheme. plus c phi n k plus 1 minus phi k minus 1 divided by 2 delta x equals to 0. And of course, this scheme is unstable. But uh, I mean, this one is the explicit scheme. You can, um, if, it, if it was stable, it would, uh, it would be just uh, the, how you solve it. You just put n plus 1 to the left-hand side, and then you write it. Right hand side is depends on previous time step. But this scheme can be repaired and become actually stable if you compute it at the next time level. The right hand side or, or this uh, advection term is computed on level n plus 1 as well. But in that case, uh, your equation would look something like uh, minus uh, uh, one half this mu. This mu is c delta t divided by delta x current number minus one half mu phi k minus one uh, n plus one plus uh, phi k n plus one plus one half mu phi k plus one n plus one equals to phi k n. So now it's you have n plus one time step here and since your previous time step which you know this one you know you don't know this one so how are you now gonna solve it? Uh, so now you have uh, three equation equation with three unknowns and that for each k. So then you have for k plus 1, you have similar equation and so on. So now you have a matrix, big matrix. Say if you have 100 grid points, it's going to be like 100, about 100 by 100 uh, values, matrix times on your vector of solution equals to some right hand side. 100, uh, what if it's 1000 grid points and it's like 1000 by 1000 matrix and you need to invert it, you need to solve this. And that would be very expensive to do. So you see that implicit schemes always involve this uh, some matrix that you need to invert. And this one is only in one dimensional case. So now imagine two dimensional, three dimensional case when you have lots of lots of it's, it becomes like really, really huge matrix. So uh, um, implicit scheme. So this one is implicit scheme. It's uh, very tedious to solve. It requires much more computer power. But is it worth it? Why Why would then we just use explicit scheme? Well, there is reason for that. Why people use implicit schemes once in a while, depending on the problem. Um, because they have this, uh, uh, they, they don't have stability issue. They can be run at any time step. Let's, let's consider, let's prove it. So we have this, our centered in space earlier our forward in time scheme and it's implicit let's prove that it's actually uh, unconditionally stable so use our lambda and our uh, new von Neumann method we'll get what we get at lambda equals here we have one minus uh, one half mu sine alpha 
uh, it just I'm not gonna write intermediate step and times R I imaginary unity. So this is lambda and uh, and we need that our absolute value of lambda sorry I forget something oh, times lambda and that's the difference now. This lambda appears because it's on time step n plus one. So we have our lambda becomes one divided by one plus i actually there is no two there plus i mu sine alpha. So we need to show that absolute value of lambda needs to be smaller than one and actually it's guaranteed that it's small, smaller than one. Why? Remember that uh, if you have one of a complex number and you want to make absolute what you do here? Well first you multiply you, you need to get rid of your uh, complex number from uh, denominator so you multiply by complex conjugate number so z times z conjugate and you remember what conjugate is so z equals to say uh, a plus ib and your complex conjugate equals to a minus ib and then it can be shown that z times z prime equals just a square plus b square which is just complex number amplitude squared so if you do this and also absolute value of conjugate number absolute number of z equals to absolute no, uh, value of conjugate number equals to so this is true so now you have this and from that you have absolute of this divided by absolute of z squared so now it becomes just absolute of this guy so it becomes absolute of z divided by absolute squared of absolute equals to 1 of absolute of z so you see this is just uh, makes sense just like for normal numbers this is same true for complex numbers so now in this case our absolute uh, value our z equals to 1 plus i some some uh, some uh, beta this mu sine alpha so absolute value equals to 1 plus mu square sine square alpha uh, square root over that so this guy is positive so you take, can take square root of it with no uh, imaginary numbers appearing. So this, uh, this number is positive. So the absolute value of z is positive. So 1 over z, which is our lambda, uh, one, of, uh, 1 of the, so our lambda becomes 1 over 1 plus mu square sine square alpha absolute value. And this guy is greater than 1 because this guy is positive. You add 1 is always greater than 1, which means that 1 over greater than 1. So lambda is guaranteed smaller than 1 for any, any mu. So you see that implicit scheme will be unconditionally stable for any mu. So you can choose any time step you want, one second, hundred seconds, whatever, it will compute just fine. So that's the beauty of uh, uh, implicit scheme, but of course um, you cannot really choose very large delta t here, even though it's unstable, I mean it's stable, but uh, very large delta t will create will distort your solution very much and so you need to find some uh, you still uh, have constraint on delta t but it's of course not by stability but by dispersion and uh, and uh, dispersion and uh, uh, and amplitude and other uh, errors 
uh, that we're going to talk about uh, in, the, in the next lecture or maybe the end of this lecture. Um, no, next lecture. So st solution will be very dispersed and very diffusive, so you need to be careful. But in any case, um, it won't be any issue with stability with uh, choosing time step. That's why people very often use implicit schemes, like if you have this three-dimensional model and you have constraint because of the speed of sound, especially in the vertical, you write your vertical equations uh, for vertical differential equations, uh, portion of that, uh, as implicit using implicit schemes and horizontal ex using explicit schemes. And as a result, you don't have stability constraint with a vertical grid, which is more severe. And instead, you just use a constraint uh, in the horizontal, which is much less severe because time uh, grid spacing in the horizontal direction, usually for many problems that we deal with, is much uh, coarser. Uh, so grid spacing is much larger than in the vertical. And um, so now, but uh, it's all nice and good, uh, but how you gonna how you gonna uh, solve this kind of equations? Fortunately, for uh, a relatively uh, small stencil, or for relatively so for this kind of case, when your k point you use only points k, k minus one, and k plus one, this is stencil. If you set for this narrow, like three points, uh, then you can use very fast uh, solver um, for this type of uh, uh, for this type of equations. Uh, it's called the like th th three diagonal matrix solver. So basically, your diagonal becomes uh, of your matrix of your uh, implicit equation because there is one main diagonal and then two around it. This is your k, k, this is your k plus 1, this is your k, this is k, k minus 1, this is k plus 1, and everywhere else there are zeros. So if you have matrix like that, then this matrix can be inverted very fast without using this kind of uh, uh, general matrix inversion uh, procedures. Uh, and. Uh, and this arises, so for example, um, this uh, actually uh, allows you to solve very large class of equations because on the right hand side you can add also your diffusion equation, like phi k minus 1 and plus 1 minus 2 k, uh, uh, sorry, phi k plus phi k plus 1 and plus 1 divided by delta x squared times diffusion coefficient. So now you have not only diff uh, advection, but also diffusion. Why you need diffusion also uh, as an implicit scheme? Because diff diffusion is also a very constrained process, especially in the vertical, for example, in the atmospheric, atmospheric flow. Uh, it has this also stability criterion. And moreover, uh, we considered leapfrog scheme. And uh, we kind of, uh, we leapfrog scheme. We showed that this that using leapfrog scheme kind of uh, allows stability uh, of uh, advection. Of course, constrained by speed of sound or advection. Uh, but uh, so you have. Uh, This leapfrog scheme, so you evaluate this uh, as a uh, centered in time and centered in space. But if you use, uh, at the right hand side, you use diffusion operator, and at time step n, it's actually unstable. The right hand side for leapfrog scheme. Of diffusion operator written at time step n can be shown that it's an unstable scheme. It cannot be used. So how to make it stable? You need to use diffusion at time uh, level n minus one. 
So if you if you use this and you still know those, right? Because you need to compute this derivative. So you know this n minus one. So if you use diffusion at n minus one, so kind of shift it back in time by one time step compared to advection, this becomes stable. Stable with normal criterion that nu times delta t divided by delta x squared should be smaller than one half. But it uh, stabilizes scheme, of course, still there is constraint. But uh, otherwise, if you use time step n, it will blow up. Even though advection operator is, will be stable, but uh, with uh, mu, equal, uh, so mu smaller than 1, but this will be unconditionally unstable. Only putting it a little bit uh, in, one, in previous times, they will stabilize it. But if you use implicit scheme like this, it will be stable regardless. It will be unconditionally stable. So, stable. This scheme is stable for any delta t. Nice scheme. But how you solve it? Uh, and uh, for that, uh, we, uh, we uh, use this again, tridiagonal. Tri a matrix solver algorithm, a faster kind of solver, uh, which has basically in general form can be written as the following. Is this kind of equation, um, it can be say different delta x's, uh, you can use your uh, second order approximation for derivatives of, uh, with, dif uh, with different time steps, so you, you will have not, or your c is actually function of space, so, and new is functional space, so your coefficients may not be constants. So generally you can write it as a follow-on, a k phi k minus 1 n, well, yeah, n plus 1, plus b k phi k n plus 1, plus c k phi k n plus 1, equals some right-hand side which is a uh, function of, of other time steps. So, um, D, say, of time step M. So this is general form of implicit equation. So it's, this is implicit. So how you solve it? Well, uh, you, you saw, uh, and now we need, of course, uh, let's add some boundary conditions. So let's say uh, for second order equation, if you have diffusion advection, uh, it's second order equation, because there is a second derivative uh, for diffusion. So you need two boundary conditions. And uh, what's those conditions? It can be, for example, uh, if it's a temperature equation, then it, let's say you fix temperature at the boundaries. Or it can be that actually flux is specified, flux of, uh, of quantities at the boundary is specified, and so on. So in general, you can, like if it's a temperature of flux, you can specify like uh, it's in general form, let's say phi, uh, it's a point two, n plus one, um, minus a phi at point n plus one at point one, divided by uh, divided by delta x equals to zero so it means no flux or insulated condition so gradient across the boundaries this boundary and also the same way you write for the right boundary equals divided by delta x equals to zero or so this is no flux but you can or you can this is derivative so new new so this is a new d phi dx this is your flux I say with minus sign equals to minus equals to some given flux f uh, uh, f1 and here you have minus new d phi dx equals to 
this guy on the right boundary equals to flux n and those are given or if you specify temperatures or you can specify just uh, phi say at point 1 equals to some given value and phi at point n equals just some constant so it's given so you can specify or you can combination of those on the left boundary you can specify say phi and the right boundary you specify flux and vice versa so generally it means that you can generally you write your boundary conditions as the following that a that b one phi uh, one plus c one phi two equals to d one and uh, b uh, a n phi n plus c n phi n plus uh, n sorry n minus one plus b n phi phi n equals to d n so this is your boundary conditions general form they incorporate all sort of boundary conditions like flux specified flux no flux insulated fixed uh, fixed value at the boundary everything can be written as this choosing correct this value so now we have this equation for internal points so this one is uh, for k equals from 2 to n minus 1 where capital n is total number of hit points for this and also we add two boundary uh, conditions or boundary equations that valid only at the boundary points and so now we have n equations and n unknowns and uh, we can solve it so how you solve it fast uh, because you if you start inverting matrix using uh, even fast uh, uh, library of uh, linear algebra on uh, say uh, Intel uh, library it still would require if you have very large uh, uh, grid say thousand grid points it would require very uh, very laborious uh, amount of computations pretty slow and expensive so instead you can use a nice method so it's called so this simple tridiagonal matrix solver or I believe it's called also Stevens algorithm. Um, I frankly I don't uh, don't remember how it's actually called. I know how it's called in uh, in my language in in Russian, but uh, it's relevant here. So so how we solve it? We do this uh, uh, substitution. We assume that our phi k can be written as some alpha k times phi k plus 1 plus beta k so we write it formally like this and then basically the idea is uh, in order to obtain uh, re recurrent conditions for alpha and beta we just substitute this into this uh, and uh, and instead of this and that way we eliminate phi k minus 1 and also we'll have alpha k minus 1 delta k minus 1 and then if you write them you will uh, you will arrive so this one is valid for k equals from 1 to n minus 1 so if you do this algebra, I, I spare it from details, but you can easily actually derive it in a in matter of one minute or so, or two minutes. You will get that alpha k uh, equals to minus c k divided by b k plus a k alpha k minus one, and beta k equals to d k minus a k beta k minus 1 divided by the same denominator
So now, uh, so now you see uh, you have this uh, kind of recurrent expression. So you need when you know alpha k minus one and uh, you know uh, beta k minus one, you can immediately compute next alpha k beta k. So uh, and so on until you reach. So you start from k equal to one. So for that you need to use your boundary conditions. And for boundary conditions, you find you need you find alpha one equals to minus c one divided by b one, and your beta one equals to d one divided by b one, and then you compute all the so these guys for k equals from two to n minus one, given alpha one and beta one. And you know these coefficients again, a, b, and c. So you move basically first, this is your grid from 1 to n. So you start here, you, compute, you move in this direction, you compute your alpha and beta. And then you arrive at the end, and where you compute your boundary, your boundary value as d n minus a n beta n minus 1 divided by b n plus a n alpha n minus 1. So it's basically beta n. So you do this and you use this d n a n and b n from your right boundary conditions. And after you computed phi n, you move to your equation, and now you know alphas, and you know phi, and k plus 1, so you can compute phi k. So if you know phi n, you know phi n minus 1, then you know phi n minus 1, you know phi n minus 2 using this. So now after that, you go back and compute your phi k using first value here, here, and then here, here, until you arrive to phi 1. And so you have kind of, first you, you move to the right, compute an alpha and betas, and then you compute phi n, and then you move back and you solve your equation. So this is very efficient and fast algorithm, and uh, it can be shown that it doesn't accumulate truncation error. So even if it's very long, uh, a very big grid, because if you do multiply, divide, and so on, uh, you don't really accumulate truncation error, which is a good thing. And uh, so you compute this guy once, because it's the same coefficient for both alpha and beta. And so you divide by the same number, so there is some optimization here to do. And unfortunately, you need to divide, and divide is a little bit slow operation on some processors. But uh, it shouldn't be too bad uh, on Intel processor. So, uh, so uh, you, you basically, it's very simple algorithm and uh, many, many problems, one dimensional problems can be solved by implicit scheme. For example, uh, uh, diffusion in the soil. Uh, it's uh, many people use explicit schemes for that, which is a big mistake because sometimes uh, so the soil grid spacing in the in the soil can be very very fine near the surface, <coughs> and, and very often uh, you can uh, you need to uh, use very small time step for that for integrating uh, say propagation of temperature temperature diffusion or moisture diffusion into the soil. If you use an implicit scheme on the other hand for soil, you don't care about that. Use it, it, it never will uh, blow up. It will never blow up. So. I, I always uh, use implicit schemes for one-dimensional, uh, for say diffusion, uh, for many things like, especially diffusion like in a, of heat or moisture in soil or in a, uh, in ice diffusion, say of uh, temperature in ice. It's very nice to use this implicit schemes, and and then you don't think even think about your stability criterion. It's always will be uh, a nice solution. Um, 
So this is uh, this this is very nice uh, algorithm, and uh, you will have uh, one. Uh, you will have to quote one example when uh, solving some uh, uh, equation, maybe for soil, <laughs> uh, in your next homework. So you will have chance to practice your uh, coding skills, uh, uh, coding this type of uh, problem. Um, So I think it's uh, it's enough for today. Uh, see you next time.